Stephen Balch, director of the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. And this is the first of a series of brief, casual talks with experts and authorities who have given lectures uh, for our series, uh, for our institute. If you want to see uh, the full lecture, uh, you can find them posted on our website. The first lecture uh, that was presented by the Institute on November 29th Greco-Roman world, um, and in particular uh, with athletics and the theater and the whole ethos of competitiveness uh, that was manifested uh, by the Greeks uh, in their athletic and dramatic lives. Um, what I'd like to talk today with Professor Lamor about uh, is the way in which the Greeks and the Romans influence the modern conception of sport. Uh, we all enjoy sport, some of us uh, as participants, uh, others uh, as fans, and of course many as both. Um, they have been developed to a singular degree in the modern world, but they do owe a great deal to antiquity where they find their roots, uh, and that's really what we want to explore now. So uh, turning to Professor Larmor, uh, let me pose um, a thought uh, about the way in which we might imagine the legacy of Greece and Rome in contemporary athletics. It seems to me that you might be able to make a case that what the Greeks invented that we still have in sports is the concept of the athlete, uh, the concept of someone who engaged in a peaceful physical contest uh, with a rival uh, for some sort of prize. Uh, but what we get from the Romans is, is something else and that is the conce conception of the fan, someone who goes to a large stadium or arena uh, and um, having paid his freight purchase for having purchased a ticket, uh, sits there and watches a struggle between paid professional athletes. So I wonder if you could, if, 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 if that makes some sense in, in, in talking about the contributions uh, that each of these two civilizations made. Um, uh, if that does make sense, maybe, maybe you could tell us why. It, it does make sense uh, to a very considerable degree, yes. Um, you are correct that the Greeks give us um, the agon, which is the Greek word for competition and struggle. And it's true that overwhelmingly among the Greeks, the focus is on individual excellence. So, for example, at the ancient Olympic festival, um, which was primarily a religious event uh, held in honor of Zeus, where competitions of various kinds took place, the vast majority of the agones that you would see would be uh, competitions between individual athletes. So, for example, in wrestling or boxing or the pankration or various other um, sports that, that have come down to us. Um, and the aim of the, of the ago there is first of all to display your um, athletic training, partly in honor of the god, but also for the uh, pleasure, for the watching pleasure of the spectators who would be there. And the aim, of course, is to achieve victory. And with the achievement of victory at the Olympic Festival, an individual athlete would be elevated to 
almost a semi-divine status, I would say. I mean, these were pan-Hellenic festivals where you would have competitors from all across the Greek world. And so to be an Olympic victor was to achieve uh, the greatest possible triumph that would be feasible. Now, there were many more competitors than there were victors, and since mm -hmm. there, it was only a first place prize that you could yes. normally get, uh, most people uh, competing couldn't realistically aspire certainly to be a victor at the Olympic Games, perhaps at a, at a, at a smaller competition. What, what, so what was in it for the, the average athlete who um, probably was not going to rise that high but still might achieve a certain measure of, of, of excellence? Um, would they have been thinking in the same way that someone who goes to the kind of the, the, the recreation building here uh, and, and tries to get buffed up or uh, climbs the, uh, the, the climbing wall. Does, uh, would, would they have had something similar in mind to a, uh, an amateur uh, athlete here at Texas Tech? Uh, well, uh, you know, my familiarity with, with that mindset is not, not, not that good. Um, I would say for the Greeks, the notion of the average athlete doesn't really exist. Um, Greek athletes who made it to the Olympia, for instance, or even to more minor festivals um, in the Greek world would have been trained to a, a fairly high degree, and um, the aim was always to be a victor. Right. And um, the emphasis on victory is also apparent from the, from the notion that they have of the uh, Periodonikes, who was the sort of grand slam victor, the, the person who managed to achieve a victory in the four main Pan-Hellenic festivals. So you have this sort of super category of victor even beyond the person who wins at, say, the Nemea or the Pythian festival. Um, so that the focus for the Greeks is very much on the achievement of Nike, of victory. Well, wasn't, don't ask me whether you've won or lost, but how you played. That was, that was not the Greek attitude. No, that's not part of their, um, it's not part of their ideology. But yet all free Greek males probably would have trained yes. for these events. Yes. Um, athletic training is a very important part of the education of the Greek male citizen. So in the city of Athens, for instance, um, all young Greek men would have practiced wrestling in the gymnasium and engaged in various other kinds of athletic activities. So the competitive urge is there from a very early age and is deeply imbued in the, in the psyche of, of the Greeks insofar as we can talk about that in a meaningful way. Um, so the notion of competition is fundamental to Greek identity and it manifests itself in, in various forms there's competition in rhetoric, competition in the law courts, in politics, and so on. And the most obvious form that we see it in is the athletic uh, competition. And as, you've, as you say, there is no prize generally for second place, for third place. Um, the, the one place where we do find that is in... Um, proto-democratic and democratic Athens, where at the Panathenaic festival, which appears to have been designed largely to induce a sense of solidarity among Athenians as a whole, there were prizes for uh, second place and third place and so on. But that's very much outside the sort of traditional four great Pan-Hellenic festivals. Um, that's an Athenian uh, invention, really, I think. And there would have been a lot of opportunities in individual matches of various kinds for, for someone who wasn't quite of Olympic caliber, nonetheless, to take pride in, in, in being a victor. Yes. Yeah. I mean, clearly, there were, as you say, very many athletes who probably were not victors, but that doesn't mean that the, the striving for it wasn't... Um, perhaps the most was, was there element. a sense, of course, you know, in, 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 in Plato, for example, there's always the notion that whatever you're doing specifically, there's always something more involved. There's a kind of higher excellence that is embodied 
in doing anything very well, a kind of spiritual excellence. Was, was that present in the, in the way in which the Greeks looked at athletics? Yes, yes, I, I, I think that's true. And uh, the terms for virtue and excellence, like arete and kudos and so on, have very considerable resonance in, in the athletic realm. And in the victory poems of Pindar, for instance, you will find these words appearing very frequently, and they are loaded with cultural and ideological significance. Um, and interestingly, in, in any victory poem composed by Pindar, you will not find much information about the athletic competition itself. You won't find details of how the victor won uh, his, his laurel wreath or whatever it is. You will find a lot of musing on the victor's family, um, thoughts about the history of the city that he comes from, and also about what this victory means and what it brings with it in terms of obligations to traditional notions of virtue and excellence um, and modesty. Uh, Pindar constantly reminds athletic victors that although they have achieved this very elevated status, they must maintain uh, an appropriate sense of, of modesty and awareness of their um, links to the human realm rather than uh, thinking that they have somehow permanently entered the, the semi-divine realm or, or are too closely connected with the gods because, of course, according to the Greek conception of life, you can never be counted happy until your dying day because you won't know what would happen. Um, so I think the athletic competition must have communicated to the viewers uh, very important lessons about life and the struggles of life, what it means to be victorious, but also the um, inherent uh, precariousness of, of any such status. And so I believe that the, the spectacle, if you want to call it that, of Greek athletic competition was um, ha had very deep layers of meaning. So the ethical, spiritual component wasn't so much in how you played the game. That is to say, the important thing was that you were fair, uh, abided by the rules, were generous. To that wasn't the important thing. But the important thing was that if you were a victor, you then in every way lived up to what a victor should be, sort of almost a semi-divine type. Yes. And not all did. There are stories of Olympic victors who go completely off the rails and misbehave quite badly. Nothing um, new there. No, <laughs> nothing, nothing new there indeed. And, and there were clearly problems with following the rules and cheating and bribery because we get quite a lot of information about um, the Halano Dikai, who are the, the judges, the of officials at the Olympic Festival. And it's very apparent from the sources that survive that rule infringement was a continuing problem. So we shouldn't have any illusions about, um, or we shouldn't idealize perhaps Greek athletes to too great an extent, um, at least in terms of their individual behavior. But it's still clear, I, I believe, that the whole agon, the whole competition, was deeply imbued with um, very significant notions of what it meant to be a, a good Greek male or an excellent Greek male. Now, the Greeks were not only citizen athletes, they were also citizen soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, was there a connection between athletics and um, preparing for combat? There, there, there certainly, well, there would be obvious connections in the sense that athletic training and military training are closely associated in, in the sense of preparing um, the male citizen athlete or the male citizen soldier for uh, physical endurance and things like that. There doesn't seem to be a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence necessarily between 
um, what you would do in most athletic events and what you would do on the battlefield, although we do find as time goes by that the Olympic program begins to include events that may have closer military like hoplite, connect, races. hoplite races and things like that. Um, yes. Uh, to go back to Athens, about which we know quite a lot and which is in some ways exceptional, it seems that the Panathenaic events may well have had slightly closer connections for military training. Um, Sparta provides another interesting example because there um, much of the time and energy of young Greek males was devoted to training for the army and that seems to have paid off in terms of um, numbers of victors at least in the early centuries at the Olympia we do see so-and-so from Sparta appearing quite often. In, in the combat sports or in any of them? In the combat sports, but also in some others. Mm -hmm. um, and as Sparta declines as a military power, the, the number of victors also goes down. So there is a, a loose connection, definitely, between the two. Uh, and, and you're right, citizen soldier, citizen athlete, these are interchangeable. Um, but also, certainly in Athens and probably elsewhere, these, um, these citizens would be receiving a very significant education in the arts and the elements of musique. Uh, Plato talks about the two sides of education being musique, which is the, the skills of the muses, which includes literature, dance, um, music, and gymnastique, which is the athletic training. And these two are very much blended together in order to create the ideal citizen male. Um, now, to move on to the Roman side where you talked about... Um, if you had gone to the, to the, the Olympiad, mm -hmm you would not have seen a, a massive stadium. You would not have had someone uh, hawking refreshments, presumably. Um, you would not have bought a ticket. Uh, it would have been a much less organized, less um, institutionalized kind, or at least uh, you, you, would, you would not have found the kind of staging that we now associate with contemporary uh, mass uh, spectator sport. But had you gone to a Roman sports activity, it not only probably would have been a different type of sport, though there would be some, I mean, there were Greek chariot races, there were Roman chariot races too, but you would have encountered the event in a very different type of setting. Um, and, and what would that have been like? That, that's correct. Um, the, the Olympic Stadium, which, which has been excavated, of course, is really very rudimentary. And from what we can tell from the sources, that was probably by design that when you watched the events at the Olympic Festival, comfort was not a consideration, uh, as it would have been, say, for Romans, well, certainly. You might as well have been a participant yourself. Yes. Watching somebody else's event. Yes. We, we do find stadiums, in Delphi, for instance, has a very nice stadium uh, up on the hillside. So it's not that they wouldn't construct stadiums, but the primary aim of this kind of building would be to allow individuals to watch the, the agones, to watch the competitions, but it's not, it's not an aim in itself, we might say. Whereas when we go to the Roman side, well, first of all, many of these individual uh, sporting activities that you see among the Greeks are, are not terribly popular with the Romans. They, they tolerate Greek athletics as a sort of peculiar and vaguely interesting sideline, but it's not an important part of Roman sporting history. Um, and we think always, of course, of the Colosseum as the sort of archetypal Roman um, space as far as watching spectacles is concerned and while there were 
many more rudimentary arenas before the Colosseum, and, and, and some of them may well have been temporary. Um, it's true that the Colosseum does, in a way, encapsulate how the Romans regarded uh, spectacles. And um, gladiatorial combat, which is probably the most familiar version to, to modern uh, uh, readers or, or viewers, does start out in a sort of very understated way, sort of fights in the marketplace or in, in the forum, and gradually it becomes more and more organized. Um, by the time we get to the, the period of the empire, um, the emperor has taken full control of the, uh, the generous donation of, of spectacles to the citizenry. And, and it's there, I presume, that you're thinking in terms of the modern fan, um, which, 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 which would be quite accurate because you do have very large numbers of um, very large numbers of spectators who flock to the Circus Maximus to watch chariot races or to the Colosseum to watch gladiators fight or um, spectacles involving wild animals, including executions of criminals and other um, undesirables from the Roman point of view. And it is there a very different kind of um, experience from what you see among the Greeks. Although, I, I think you can still say that very important aspects of Roman identity were being enacted in these gladiatorial combats in the arena. So while in one sense the spectators are looking down literally, but also uh, metaphorically, they're looking down upon a sort of despised other, a prisoner, a criminal, you know, a prisoner of war, um, and watching that other being systematically taken apart and destroyed. Um, it's also, I think, evident from some of the literary sources that, particularly with the gladiatorial combats, when Roman spectators watched these fights, which they did with a great deal of interest and, and intensity, it seems, they were seeing enacted certain talismans of Roman identity. So bravery, courage, not flinching. For example. But, but not by Romans themselves. Generally not, although there is evidence particularly in the high period of the empire, that sometimes Roman citizens would enroll themselves voluntarily into gladiatorial schools. And take their chances just like the other gladiators. And take their chances just like the other gladiators. Also, we do have information about very successful and popular gladiators who were celebrities, very much in the, in the modern sense, with their fan base uh, and their followers. Um, the extent of their freedom would vary according to their status. Um, and we shouldn't think either that all gladiators were killed on their first outing. That's certainly not the case. Um, it wouldn't make good economic sense for the owner of the gladiatorial schools. Um, so the outcomes of the contests were probably very varied. So now you also have people who are entrepreneurs in the sports business. Yes. Owners of gladiatorial schools and their gladiators. Yes. And how are they making money? Well, they would train the glad gladiators and then these gladiators would be hired out and they would make money that way. There'd be prizes um, that would go to the owner of the gladiator? I, I'm not certain about the uh, particular mechanisms of the funding, but there was there was certainly a profit in it, yes, there was money to And that's made. very different from the Greek situation as well. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, and of course, it's not only in the Colosseum, which is the sort of Roman arena par excellence, but all over Italy and all over the empire, you would have arenas. Wherever the Romans went, they took their building programs with them. So 
you know, in the most far-flung provinces of the empire, in, in Britannia, for instance, you, you would have arenas, either makeshift ones or... Did it, did it catch on in them. the Greek-speaking world, this it approach? It caught on less mm -hmm. in the eastern part of the empire. Um, Greek intellectuals certainly regarded these competitions as you know, vaguely barbaric and unseemly. And they, they were not as popular there. But, but generally, the Romans exported them systematically across the empire. So, of course, there was a, there was a very large economic machine. Um, you had to procure exotic animals from North Africa and other parts of the empire. You had to bring them to Rome. You had to store them um, in, the, you know, in the basement of the Colosseum. We have cells for humans and, and animal participants in the, in the spectacles. Um, there would be money to be made, no doubt, in other ways from, from the competition. And it was vaguely disreputable to traditional Roman thinking. The whole thing is, is shrouded in a uh, sort of cloud of ambiguity, really, as to whether it's really respectable or not. Um, there's very little concern about the cruelty aspect involved. You do get a little bit of criticism from Seneca and some other philosophers, but, but the criticism is more in terms of the negative effect on the viewers of sitting there rather passively watching. But presumably that was the point. I mean, in the case of Greek athletics, it was the positive effect on the participants that yes. was really being sought after. Yes. In the Roman case, while Seneca may have thought that it was degrading, mm -hmm. maybe it was indeed the effect on the spectator that much of this was all about, that the Roman authorities wanted to achieve uh, some sort of impact on, on the spectator, maybe some sort of change in the nature of the spectator. Was, was, was that at work? Well, the, the Roman term for these kind of spectacles is munus, which is a, is a Latin word with multiple meanings, but it does include things like gift, uh, benefit, uh, duty, uh, obligation. And in, in the Republican period, we see figures like Julius Caesar giving spectacles to crowds, obviously you know, not unrelated to his desire to further his political career. And in the age of the empire, as, as I said earlier, the emperor takes over the role of, of editor, the one who, who gives, it's the same word as editor in English today, the one who gives, the one who puts out the spectacles for, um, as, as a generous gift. Is this sort of a kind of, um, just like the public feasts might have been in, in Rome. Mm. Uh, it's a kind of exchange. Um, I'm giving you entertainment, uh, sensation, uh, and, and what I sort of implicitly expect from you is, is loyalty. You're yes. going to be happy about this. Yes, I, I, I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. Now, the whole thing works because there is at the same time as this rather sort of base motive, there is at the same time, I believe, um, again, a, a complex layering of meaning in the spectacles, which the viewers, which the spectators would have picked up on. There was a certain amount enjoyed. of residual religious significance even to the Roman spectacle, that gladiatorial combat. It was yeah. clearly a sacrificial element. Um, in a way, it also reminds them of the power of their empire by bringing in you know, different types of gladiators from, from various provinces, animals and, and other victims from, from all over. It reminds the Romans of who they are. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about the arena is that it's a very solid building. Um, it's in stone and there appears to be a very clear division between the spectators in the seats and the victims and the fighters in the arena. There's a drop down, for instance, and so they couldn't get out, obviously, or injure any spectators. Um, so, so the whole thing is, in a way, architecturally extremely solid, but 
when you look at sources, particularly poetic sources, I, I think there's a, a certain amount of fluidity and porosity between the sand in the arena and the supposedly very far removed spectators. And I, I think in a way there was a complicated dynamic of identification and lack of identification. In a way, the Romans saw something which was completely not them, which was other. And yet, especially in terms of the gladiatorial combats, they saw something which was, in a way, also them at the same time. So it's not totally different from the Greek paradigm vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship between the spectacle and the participants and those who are watching. It's not totally different, but it is, you know, it's, it's bound up with Roman ideology, which is in many ways quite different from, from, from the Greeks. You know, the Romans were an imperial power and very much concerned with um, expanding and keeping control of their empire. What, what brings this all finally to an end, I guess, with the end of the ancient world itself? What, what the, the Roman spectacles, what, what finally happens with, with those? Well, um, when the Christians come along, they are not terribly well disposed to um, any manifestations of um, the old Roman religious practices. Um, it would be a mistake, I think, to say that they shut down the gladiatorial games out of some sort of moral concern or sympathy for um, the victims involved. There may have been some of that, but from what we read in sources like Tertullian, for instance, it, it's more apparent that what Christians objected to was the, the religious links with these that, that were apparent in the, in the rituals. So gladiatorial combats do decline and eventually are phased out. On the, Olympic. On the eastern side, um, the Olympic festival pr proves surprisingly durable. It lasts well into the fourth century. Um, and Greek athletic competition seems to continue for quite a while too. And that really lasts until Theodosius um, systematically begins to shut down these competitions. Um, and, and then it sort of fades out. Um, but the, the Greek athletic um, activity and the, the ideological elements in it seem to have been extremely durable and to have lasted for well over a thousand years and um, were in some ways, I suppose, um, more substantial than what we might find on the Roman side. Now, you're a product of the British public school system, which means private schools in, in, in Britain, and um, they pick up on both of these traditions in some ways in, in the 19th century and the manner in which they approach the, the physical education of boys. Could you, could you tell us about what, what the sort of revival of this kind of antique approach to athletics involved in, in Britain? I know a little bit about it, um, mainly from my studies in um, the history of Greek athletics. And in the 19th century, um, I, I believe, closely connected with the the activities required for running the, the empire, um, British schools um, regarded it as very important that there should be not only training in classical literature, which was the, the foundation of um, the intellectual side, but also uh, that physical activity was important. Now, there are, there are various reasons for this. It's not only a desire to imitate classical predecessors. There are it's part of the classical education. But it is part of the classical mm -hmm. education, yes. And um, I, there is, I think, more of an emphasis on team sports, however, in this particular paradigm. Um, the ancients were not really interested in team sports. They don't exist in any 
significant faction either among the Greeks or the Romans. Um, but um, the ideology uh, sort of governing these schools in the 19th century is very much bound up with notions of working together as a team um, and also playing the game. And you do find there quite a significant reliance on notions of it's not winning that matters, but it's how you play the game. Uh, in terms of, of, of why that, that change and emphasis occurs? Well, I, I suppose it's due to um, what they thought would work best for running the empire. Um, there's, a, there's, of course, a very significant uh, factor in terms of social class being involved here. And class solidarity would mean playing together as a team. Um, it's, not, it's not that individual excellence is not prized. It is. But um, if you read, say, novels set in these schools or some of the um, ma boys' magazines that came out in the late 19th century and even into the, even into the 20th century, um, the ideology of these schools has, has a lot of, there are a lot of watchwords like fairness and uh, playing the game. Uh, you know, wh whether that was reflected in reality is an entirely different matter. But again, you have this sort of link between the athletic activity itself and very important aspects of social identity. Um, and it's from there, really, that we get the, con the concept of the amateur athlete. Um, the amateur athlete was prized. Professionalism was very much frowned upon. Um, the, a the ideal, really, was to be a good amateur athlete, not somebody who did it for money, but somebody who did it. I wonder whether the emphasis on how you play the game is becoming central reflects the more liberal quality of, of, of British society in the 19th century, a much more lawful, uh, rule-based society than, than, than probably Rome was, uh, or the Greeks, or, or maybe I'm wrong on that. Um, that's, a, that, that's a really large question and not an easy one to answer. Well, we're going to uh, put people on the I spot. <laughs> in these, uh. I, I, I think many people who went through those schools might question whether they were uh, places of, of sort of freedom and, and liberal thinking. Um, but perhaps you were being prepared for that. In the yes, rule-based for sure. Mm -hmm. um, they were really designed to inculcate certain values into the, the children who were sent there and to create a kind of product, a, a citizen of a particular variety, uh, whom, who they believed would uh, be able to go out and run the country or run the, the various parts of the, of the empire. Is, is there a message that uh, we in early 21st century America can take from the sporting experience of the Greeks and the Romans? Well, um, sports in modern America have become very professionalized, I gather, although there was originally a, an amateur versus professional um, distinction. What surprises me sometimes is how very similar the, um, the concerns are. So notions about cheating, um, bribing, what kind of diet the athletes follow in, you know, brackets. Are they taking drugs or something like that? Um, the, the notion of the fan, the spectators. Uh, and one would like to think, although I, I don't know for sure, but one would like to think that there is also here a fairly complex dynamic going on between the spectators and the, um, the viewers. The prevalence of team sports uh, makes for an interesting 
situation vis-a-vis individual excellence. You know, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you balance the striving for individual excellence against or with uh, the success of the team? Uh, this side of the player award. Yes, yes. And, and you still have sports, of course, like tennis, where it's all on the individual. Uh, and this would be something I think that particularly Athenian culture might have resonances with, where you do have that rather unusual in Greeks in the Greek context, that rather unusual sort of combination of individual excellence with um, the success of the team, the success of the group. Um, so I think there are many possible areas of of correspondence there between the two and, and certainly the, the role of sporting activity in the, in the culture, speaking of, of American culture, is, is very significant. I mean, these are our major social events in, in many universities, in many, many cities. So as, as in Greek and, and Roman days, our sports continue to have a significance that goes way beyond the physical activity that they I think embody. they must. Yeah. Yes, I think they must. I, I'm not an expert on most of the modern ones, but I think there must be some kind of similar um, multi-layered quality to it. Uh, if you think about the, the popularity of things like mixed martial arts, for instance, um, I don't think that just suddenly manifested itself out of nowhere. There were probably currents which were feeding into that in the very early days, and now it has become something very significant and very popular in many ways. And I would assume that um, the spectacle which is involved there communicates on multiple levels, not only with participants, but also with the, the viewers. And of course, you have still this combination of the Greek element, the sort of training of the athlete to a very high level of skill, the focus on individual excellence, you know, who wins mm -hmm. whatever championship it happens to be. Um, you have that combined with the sort of uh, lively fan base that you identified in the, in the Roman paradigm. So I would see many American sporting activities as being fed into from both Hellenic and and Roman lines in a in a rather interesting way, I have to say. Well, uh, we could go on for a long time, but we do have that uh, tennis set that we're going to go and play now, right, and then exactly. we, so we have, we have to break it here. But striving thank for individual <laughs> excellence. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much for for spending some some time with us and. Uh, and, and kicking off our series of interviews, just as you did so admirably our series of lectures. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure.